Well, as you know from previous shows, Nonprofit Spotlight uh, is a production of the Volunteer Advisory Committee here at, at uh, Community Television. And every program we highlight a uh, nonprofit in Santa Cruz, Santa Cruz County doing wonderful, wonderful work. And uh, we're really fortunate to have with us uh, uh, today Ronnie Lipschitz, who is the co founder of the Sustainable Systems Research Foundation. Ronnie, welcome. Uh, hi. I wanted to, before we start, and uh, we have a, a wealth of programming to go through, that's the wonderful things that you are doing uh, for sustainability in Santa Cruz County and really uh, providing you know, so many different kinds of benefits to the county through your work. I wanted to read kind of a, a statement that you were kind enough to send us. It said, SFRF focuses on a broad range of environmental, social, and resource issues and problems that confound communities defy singular techn technical or social solutions and cannot be addressed successfully at a global scale. I think that's a wonderfully uh, compact and focused statement. So, Ronnie, tell us a little bit about yourself, your co-founders, Kevin Bell and Thomas Rettenwender, and uh, kind of how you got involved with this work. Uh, well, I've been doing work in the environmental field since the late 70s. And um, I did a PhD at UC Berkeley in energy and resources ah. and, and managed to get hired in the political science department here at UC Santa Cruz to teach international relations and, and foreign policy. Mm -hmm. That was in 1990. And I retired last year. Um, Congratulations. <laughs> but certainly, it's certainly better than what I was doing. Uh -huh. um, but I, was, I taught uh, environmental politics you know, throughout the 30 years and did various kinds of projects. And about, what, in 2012, I became provost of Rachel Carson College. So, oh, goodbye, um, wow. you know, UCSC has these 10 residential colleges and each college has an academic head called provost. When the, the campus was founded, of course, the provost had much more authority um, and, and power to do things. And, and now it's pretty much a figurehead sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there's certain kinds of functions. And, and the reason, one of the reasons I was hired was because I wanted to start a, an academic program in sustainability studies, right. uh, minor. And, mm -hmm. and um, it, the, the college seemed to be one of the best places to do it because departments are difficult. Let's just leave it at that. Right. Um, so, I was able to, to do that, um, and I was also able to get the endowment that named the college, uh, although that was serendipitous rather than, um, you know, the result of hard work. Mm -hmm. um, but we started the minor, and we had a number of projects that we wanted to try and do within the context of the university, and it turned out to be really difficult for, for various mm -hmm. reasons not the least of which it's a big institutional bureaucracy and you know money is scarce and right so we came up with this idea of trying to start a nonprofit that would let us do projects outside of the university mm -hmm. without having to go through the bureaucracy now while i was a, a faculty member i wasn't really allowed to do that i mean i did it anyway but, <laughs> But a couple of years ago, it's now about three years ago, uh, as I was getting close to retirement, um, I started to work on the, uh, the nonprofit to try and, and develop it. And, and I should say that, so we, it was founded in 2015 by Kevin Bell, who was teaching in the minor uh, at Rachel Carson College. He's mm -hmm. got a background in power engineering, uh, a rather elect, uh, um, power, public power policy. Mm -hmm. electricity policy, and Thomas Rettenwender, who was also teaching uh, in the minor, and he's an architect based in, um, in Carmel. Okay. Um, and uh, we were the three co-founders, and, and we put together a, a, uh, a board, and so uh, a few years ago, some students started poking us, and we decided, okay, it's time to start actually doing something. And I should, ba you know, preface this by saying that Back in 1988, I co-founded a nonprofit organization in Berkeley called the Pacific Institute for uh, Studies in Environment Development and Security, mm -hmm. uh, which had gotten a very small grant from the Plowshares Fund. And, and but that was a different time. 
nonprofit organizations were much fewer. Uh, the competition wasn't nearly as fierce. Mm -hmm. The organization, you know, just as, as we were about to, to call it quits, we got our first grant at the time. And, and it's been quite successful. I have nothing to do with it, but it's been quite successful. So, so, you know, I thought, well, okay, I've done this before. I can do it again. But, of course, the, the number of nonprofits in the country has, has exploded, and it's become a kind of a, you know, an employment uh, sector for new gra college graduates, right. right? And in some ways, the old sort of management stratum in big companies where where liberal arts graduates used to go no longer exists right, right? um so anyway we had four areas that we were interested in uh in pursuing and and we were told you know this was too many one of them had to do with local renewable energy particularly electricity right, right. The second one had to do with housing uh mm -hmm. affordable housing in santa cruz and by the way these all grew out of the university Okay, right, out of right. things that we want. The third one was urban agriculture. Hmm, hmm. And then the fourth one was waste management. Um, so all four of these uh, we started to work on because we thought the university had blown some opportunities, you know, was, was taking, doing, pursuing the wrong paths for housing, for example, and um, started to, to pursue them. Um, you know, again, being kind of naive because sort of like engineers, we thought, oh, we have some great ideas. You know, people are going to fasten onto these great ideas and it's going to be fairly straightforward to start these programs. Um, and of course, that's not how things work. That's not how startups work. Uh, most startups fail because the founders never do any market research. They never actually know if anyone wants what they're offering. And then about a year ago, of course, COVID hit. So we were, you know, we were pushing along and then everything sort of shut down. But it's been a useful year because, yeah. first of all, uh, we did everything on Zoom. It saves an enormous amount of time. You don't have to travel to meetings, which, you know, uh, however impersonal it is. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've, and, and I started working at home, which I'd never done before. Um, and it allowed me to do, you know, work that, that was really interesting, it allowed us to do work that was really interesting. You know, as somebody, you know, somebody that, you know, has worked uh, in, in nonprofits myself, uh, I know uh, how competitive that field is, you know, yeah. how difficult it is to compete for uh, the dollar to be able yeah. to do your work. And has, uh, has the COVID-19, this pandemic, did that uh, reduce or restrict at all your ability to get the funding you need to push some of these programs forward? <laughs> well, we've been mostly funded out of pocket uh -huh. for, the last, for the last three years. Well, actually for our entire existence. And, mm -hmm. and it's only because, you know, I was well paid by the university and now I have a very nice pension and, and that we have access to some other, uh, an anonymous donor and, you know, and we keep, I mean, we're working on, you know, funding strategies and trying to find find a more reliable sources of, of funds. Um, so it didn't have an impact because we're low cost. We don't pay ourselves. We have one full-time staff person who is working, who's just gotten another position that pays twice as much. Uh, good for her. Um, and... Um, you know, and my, my, my sort of objective is never to be too big so that we don't have to struggle every month to make payroll. Mm -hmm. um, and instead to try and build uh, coalitions and groups and collaborations, you know, and drawing on, on other organizations and people and groups who are doing things better mm -hmm. than we are. So we're not going to reinvent the wheel. We're not going to sort of do, a, you know, everything. We try to put the pieces together to uh, to, to network, and um, one of our advantages is well, we, we're trying to apply systems thinking, and we're trying to be very interdisciplinary, and recognize. Let me take housing for example, the please, ADU, please. Yeah, right? Yeah. So, so housing involves construction, permitting. Uh, it may involve uh, title companies, depending on who owns the land. It involves banks. Um, of course, homeowners are very important, right? They're, they're, oh, and, and if you want to do any kind of, of 
modular prefab man manufacturing for, for, you know, ADUs or housing, mm -hmm. then, mm -hmm. then it's the manufacturers as well. And uh, they work together, but it's all a very kind of haphazard operation. And so if you can start to build connections among these different sectors, right. you know, sort of act as you might say the, the, uh, the lubricant to bring them together, right. that, that, that I think helps to facilitate the projects that we're trying to do. Now, I have to confess, we haven't managed to build an ADU yet. Um, but, yeah, yeah. you know, I'm working on, on building a local, a regional organization, I'm mm -hmm. making mm -hmm. contacts with other groups that are working on ADUs and small scale housing and, and are trying to connect to community colleges, uh, construction programs to, to look for, uh, you know, workers for labor. I mean, there's a all kinds of pieces to put together and and i think that's what we do pretty well have you, have you uh, any work have you with the habitat, the habitat for humanity? humanity well we did and um we have talked to habitat and and um you know habitat is a is a in many ways a kind of a niche organization because oh. of the uh the sweat equity that's that's required and you know the targets they're they're targeting in particular uh, homeowners or, or people who have financing and are a certain a certain income level, um, and our kind of notion is that there are a lot of people out there who are house rich, cash poor. Right. They've right. been living in their houses, right, because of Prop 13. Mm -hmm. Their taxes are low, uh, and they can't move. They're trapped, and so ADUs, accessory dwelling units, offer different opportunities to move out of the main house into a smaller structure and rent exactly. the, you know, the house yeah. or uh, to find tenants and, and generate a, an income stream if the ADU is inexpensive enough, you know, or bring family members right. or help people who work in the city but can't afford to live here, move here, like teachers, policemen, firemen. Right. And it turns out that the major climate impact that's eliminated by this kind of strategy is um, is uh, commuting is is carbon dioxide greenhouse gases from commuting uh, and so you know it's it again some of these things start to fit together in ways that nobody really thinks about very much. No, I, I think if you talk to people who do uh, sustainable transportation and uh, 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 they're talking right. about the kind of working more can can. Yeah. So that yeah. Uh, you, know, you can live locally, work locally, and uh, reduce the carbon footprint, and yet increase uh, the availability of units for either rental or for you, the family, as you say. And we've talked about this before. Uh, you build an ADU in the back, you rent out the main house, and you, you live in the ADU. But one yeah. thing it does for me, and one of the fascinations I had with that, and one of the reasons why I've been uh, so strong about uh, supporting county and city programs but it, is it increases uh, the rental stock because there's so much pressure Absolutely. here on Santa Cruz, a rental stock. And now when the students come back after the pandemic next year, you'll have the students coming back, uh, the working poor, a section of housing voucher holders, all those people competing for a really small pool of rental stock. And ADUs is, is to me, one of the uh, key answers to that. There's another thing actually that's worth noting, and that is that you know we don't quite know how many people houses have been occupied by by the same owners for thirty or more years. Mm. Um, we're going to be doing a GIS study this summer, trying to map this out for the whole county. Mm. But if you take the sort of average homeowner who has lived in a home for thirty years, they may have had children. You know, maybe three bedroom house. There are empty bedrooms all over the county, right? right? And and um, so there are there are living spaces, but they're underutilized. Yeah. And, and I think that's yeah. And there, uh, folks, uh, aside from the. Uh, 
folks that work uh, as you do, or academicians, or activists, are always interested, and more so now, I think, in how much empty space we have in terms of dwelling units. And there's an yeah. awful lot of that in Santa Cruz. And there really is no, uh, I don't think, any accurate statistical survey of that, as you suggest, to yeah. really see you know, where we are with that and see what our baseline is to try to make that uh, more, to raise the occupancy. Yeah, no, that's that's true. That's the case. Um, another project that we're trying to develop is focused on um, solar microgrids. Wonderful. Yeah. Which are you know small scale generating plants uh, that you can you could in theory at least build in different parts of the city to provide electricity to to nearby buildings or buildings you know underneath them mm -hmm. uh, store electricity for uh you know for the night time and then provide resilience if there are blackouts i mean that's a sort of fairly simple description but we're trying to work on a project in watsonville which is i think pretty unique and that is that we want to sell solar electricity to a company a food company in watsonville and set up the operating structure in such a way that we can use the profits to fund a basic income program for farm workers. Really? So, so the idea here is, you know, so rather than, than operating the grid purely for profit and investors, you make it a, a, a partially a sort of a social, you know, a social good. Right. And, and part of the philosophy is that solar energy falls on anyone, everyone. It's part of, a, of an energy commons right. and it's being expropriated by people who have capital. Right. And um, just like all other, res so many other resources, right? It's taken for free, it's turned into electricity, and then it's sold. And what if you could actually extract value for people who need, you know, who are poor from that resource? Uh, you sell lower cost electricity to businesses. Mm -hmm. And right, and then the money that the operation makes goes into social services. Right? Well, that's so. a wonderfully holistic approach, I think. You know, to <laughs> to social <laughs> problems that, that we all have. It, it, it's 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 uh, been shocking to me over time. Uh, Santa Cruz gets uh, and Watsonville as well gets 300 uh, days of sun every year, and we have so many solar capable rooftops that we just aren't taking advantage of. And, and one of the reasons is that they've made it absorbently expensive to do. It takes a long time to get off the grid, and now you know people are trying to figure out, you know, how can I do that? And they're being kind of you know, these obstacles are presenting themselves and make it more difficult for them. It's actually, you know, it's actually somewhat more complicated because the, the big private utilities um, are very concerned uh, about the, the proliferation of solar because it undermines their model of selling electricity to customers. <laughs> and so there's led, there was led, recent legislation that was deemed to be very damaging. Mm -hmm. to uh, rooftop solar. It, it died in the assembly, or at least it's been tabled in the assembly. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a clear sort of strategy going on by which the big utilities want to import renewable energy from, you know, faraway places. And they may be within the state or they may be in New Mexico, mm -hmm. uh, so that their transmission systems continue to operate because that's how they make a lot of their money. Right. by charging for the use of the transmission systems yeah. as opposed for the uh, electricity itself. Have you been studying or are you uh, involved with uh, the community power uh, programs that we have that I uh, can't remember the name, it's the Monterey? 3CE, Three, Three no, it's not called California Coast Community Energy. All right, thank you. I think, yeah. I think that's what it is. Yes, yes, we have been um, watching them, you know, attending meetings, mm -hmm. uh, proposing things, uh, projects. We proposed this Watsonville project to them, but it doesn't quite fit their portfolio. And 3CE three, three is a bit reluctant to uh, commit to local energy resources, energy mm -hmm. generation. Uh, again, the, 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 community, uh, the community choice aggregators, which is what 3CE is, it's it's not a generator of electricity. It basically is a distributor. It buys wholesale power 
and then it gives, you know, then it sends it to customers and it tries to keep the price a little bit below PG&E's. Right. Um, right. Um, but that means that, that anything that, that carries the risk of increasing rates is not attractive. It's much more attractive to import power from cheap, very cheap power from far away. Mm -hmm. um, and so there are people, I'm one of them, who are trying to push 3CE to uh, commit to a policy of more local renewables by 2030, something like that. And, um, you know, we'll see what happens. So you have a political science background. Is one of your uh, your, your functions uh, uh, advocacy or, or, or lobbying for certain changes in how power is uh, distributed or how power is uh, provided? So I, I'm not a lobbyist, but I've never well, been. I've been never very been, alluded no, no, to I, I'm saying what, I'm, what I want to say is that, that I think what we're trying to do is come up with projects that are technically feasible, although they may be very difficult politically and in terms of regulations, mm -hmm. that will benefit the community, that are, you know, attractive in, in, in terms of addressing uh, concerns, policy concerns, mm -hmm. and then trying to figure out how to get them to become real, real things, right? How to realize them. And, um, yeah, you know, again, the kind of logic is you see something that's such a great deal, you can't say no. But I mean, that's that's sort of how we're thinking. And we're, we're partially working through markets, right. um, you know, taking advantage of, of various kinds of markets. Although I don't, I'm not particularly wild about that as a right. strategy. I think our social policy should, you know, be renewable, highly committed to renewables, support them. Uh, provide them to the uh, to low income families and communities. I, I, basically, a lot of the stuff that's in the Green New Deal. Yeah. Right, um, right. Right. Have you found it uh, easier to uh, work with or to be able to introduce uh, your programs in the yeah. South Bay to Watsonville City Council, Santa Cruz City Council, Board of Supervisors? Are any of those uh, elected bodies more or less difficult to work with? I think, you know, I think our sense is that Watsonville is somewhat more welcoming. I would not be surprised. Right, than, than, than Santa Cruz. Santa Cruz turns out to be a fairly, in many ways, a very risk averse place. Um, and uh, so, um, uh, and, and the county is, is somewhere in between, you know, so, uh, we're we're doing our, our best to get uh, to generate support from city governments, but I think that's going to be a long haul because mm -hmm. it's not in their uh, they they don't they don't really want to take on projects like this um, because of the financial implications. Yeah. I think. Yeah. Well, I'm not a bit surprised, uh, having worked uh, with the various political institutions kind of all over the county. So Watsonville seems to be more willing to take uh, chances on things that are benefiting the community, that they really see as something that, uh, uh, that addresses poverty, addresses food sustainability, addresses right. energy. They're, they're more willing to put themselves out there to take a chance on things. Yeah, no, I think that's the case, right? It's, and it's because they're, the needs are, are greater, um, right? There's less capital. The, 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 the people who live there, are, who live in Santa Cruz, are generally much better off. I mean, if you look at the numbers, you know, the median income in Santa Cruz is somewhere around $100,000. Yeah. And in Watsonville, it's, it's fifty or $60,000. So the north and north uh, south county disparity in so many different things is a really stark. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So what uh, we've got a few minutes left. It's been fascinating just uh, listening to you talk about this kind of holistic approach to sustainability and all the things you're doing. And we certainly I personally wish you well. And we certainly do of all the people that I know who are, who are really keenly interested in this. What is the number one priority for you, would you say right now for your your foundation and to push it forward? Well, you know, funding is always an issue, right? 
And, and I think what we would like to be able to do is, is develop a, a, a little bit more capacity in terms of, mm. of both kind of intellectual weight, right? Scientific engineering weight, but, but sensitivity to the fact that everything is political. Yeah. You know, I mean, we say everything is economic, but actually more than that, everything is political, right? right. And, to become, and to be politically savvy, not to get too big, Mm -hmm. And to build, you know, as many connections as we can with others who are working on the same problem. So, so again, as I said earlier, I, I don't want to have to make salary every month, payroll every month, mm -hmm. right? But I want to try and make a difference. And I want to go beyond the, just the good idea. That's the other thing, is that not just writing papers that said, this is what we can do, mm -hmm. but, you know, this is how we're going to do it. And I think that's the most important. Again, and that's why we say locally, because, you know, saving the world is a pretty complicated thing, mm -hmm. pretty difficult. Whereas you can have much more impact where you live and you can provide models that can be reproduced and scaled up elsewhere. That's the most important thing, yeah. is that if you can make something succeed in one place, it can be adapted and reproduced elsewhere. And, and so it's a kind of a, a bottom-up vision of a sustainable world, right? Rather than coming from a, a, a right. the UN and 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 above, mm -hmm. it's doing doing things that people can get their hands dirty with, yeah. uh, you know, where they are. Well, I appreciate the fact that you're walking the walk locally for as often as I hear, you know, let's live locally, let's buy locally, let's work locally. Uh, there isn't as much uh, done to really make that uh, uh, available to people, to yeah. make it a reality, as I would like to see. So to see you, somebody like yourself and, and your foundation uh, really, you know, not only talking the talk articulately, but walking it as well and getting some traction and doing some things is very refreshing and I think very hopeful. Yep, I, 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 I'm hopeful too, right? It's my retirement project and, uh, you know, so I have to give it a few years and see if we make it. <laughs> well, you seem to have plenty of energy uh, to be able to you know, do these things and really uh, you know, apply yourself and your intensity and your focus to this. Ryan, we've got uh, about a minute again. Uh, Ryan Lipschitz, uh, the, sustain the, the Sustainable Systems Research Foundation. It's been great having you here. We just scratched the surface on these many wonderful projects you have going on and listening to the kind of the holistic approach to, to sustainability and, and food sustainability and, and doing those things. Um, something you'd like to say to our viewers uh, as, we, as we go out? Well, you know, you can find more out more on the web. You look up oh, sustainablesystemsfoundation.org, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, or you can, you know, get in touch with me. It's pretty fun, easy to find my email address. And the last thing is you can listen to Sustainability Now on K-Squid, which is uh, every what Sunday, after, every other Sunday afternoon. Um, and, you know, learn something about what's going on around us in California. A great recommendation, and I'm sure all my friends who do listen to K-Squid uh, religiously are going to be tuning into that now. Ronnie Lipschitz, thanks again for being here. Uh, the best of luck, and thank you for this, as I say, really holistic and I think uh, potentially very successful approach to all sorts of community benefits. So thanks a lot, and we'll be talking to you again soon and listening to you as well. Thank you very much, Steve. You're certainly welcome. I've been Steve Plage. Tune in next time for our next, our next edition of Nonprofit Spotlight, where we'll highlight another uh, wonderful uh, nonprofit in Santa Cruz County doing uh, great work as uh, these folks here. So I'll see you next time.